conducted on April 12, 2005 at the Niles Public Library. My name is Neil O'Shea, and I'm speaking with William Shipp. Mr. Shipp was born on December the 16th, 1925 in Chicago, and now lives in Niles. Mr. Shipp learned of the Veterans History Project through the librarian Ted Gayford, who also provided him with the brochure describing the project. Mr. Shipp has kindly consented to be interviewed for this project, and here is his story. Uh, Bill, when did you enter the service? July 20th, 1944. And where were you living at that time? I was living in an unincorporated area outside of Franklin Park, where I went to school. So were you in high school at that time? Yes. And you probably graduated somewhere in there, did you? I graduated in June, and when I graduated, I was holding three things in my hand. One was my high school diploma. The second one was a certificate for four years of perfect attendance, no absence or tardy in high school. And the third thing was a letter from my draft board asking me to report to, to duty. So you were drafted. Um, what, were you drafted into a branch of service then, or did you choose a branch of service? Well, they asked us, which branch of service did you want to go into? I already had a brother who was in the Army. And I didn't know how to swim, so I didn't think the Navy was the perfect one for me. So I said, Army. And they took a big stamp that was about three inches high and five or six inches wide, stamped right on my application, Army. So they could not miss it. No mistakes. And then where were you inducted? In Fort Sheridan, Illinois. And then uh, what were your first days like uh, and then adjusting to the Army? Well, it really was the first time I was away from home. And I was like everybody else. Everybody else was in the same situation. So we were happy to get brand new clothes, to have free meals, and they gave us a battery of tests. So life seemed to be pretty good. So was that before boot camp? Oh, yes. <laughs> what was boot camp and training like? And where was it? And well, I took some, a, a lot of tests and one of the things I took was a typewriter typing test. And I passed the test 40 words a minute. They looked at this and they said, oh, this man can type and he's good at machines. So let's send him down to Florida, learn to op how to operate a machine gun. Well, I never fired a machine gun in my, my life or, a, or any kind of a rifle. But I went. And were the instructors pretty good down there in, in Florida? They, or? they all knew what they were doing. Many of them were veterans who had been in combat before, and they came back and were passing on their skills. So that training camp in Florida, that was called? Camp Landing, Florida. Camp Landing. And did you have to make some adjustments to living there after? Well, it was always nice and warm. I missed the black dirt. Everything they had down there was sand, sand, sand. And we were out in the no man's land. And was that the first time in your life you were away from an extended period of time from, from home? Or? Yes, it was. I, I never was away from home before. How was the food? <laughs> well, they gave us plenty of it, and I thought that was great. Um, 
after boot camp, did you receive some advanced training then on the, on the machines, the machine guns? No, the training uh, program was for 17 weeks, which included training first on rifles, then on machine guns, and then on mortars. We also had additional training on just about every kind of weapon you could think of. Pistols, which I eventually carried. Bazookas to knock out a, a tank. What was the most difficult um, piece of the equipment to learn how to operate? Or were they all challenging? Well, they all were challenging. Was it a danger or something? They, they gave it. We had to know how to take these things apart in the dark. So, what we did is we took, for example, a machine gun and, and put it on a blanket and rolled the blanket over the machine gun so we couldn't see it. So, we could feel in there. We had to take it all apart, lay out the parts. Somebody would come and take a look at it, one of the instructors. And say, okay, and they put the blanket over it and they say, now put it back together again. So we would have to, without seeing it, just by feel, would have to put the machine in back in order. And if you put it back in working condition, you pass the test. Did most people pass the test after that? After lots of practice, yes. After camp, camp blanding? Yes. Were you, did you have any other assignments in the, in, in the States before you no, were overseas? No. From camp, camp Landing, I went for a 10-day furlough at home, and I had orders from there to go to Boston, Boston, Massachusetts. And then from Boston, you Boston sailed to? We got on a ship about the 1st of January, 1945, and uh, went to La Havre, France. We went there as replacements, and they put us on a train about 10 o'clock at night, and we woke up the next morning, not woke up, but we, the next morning we were in Belgium. And your, uh, your new family, so to speak, in Europe, was a particular company or division or army or...? Well, my closest family was the 75th Infantry Division, the 289th Battalion, which is the first... the 289th Regiment, the 1st Battalion, which consisted of a, B, and C companies, which are rifle companies, and D company, which was the heavy weapons company, consisting of machine guns and mortars, bazookas. So that put you in D company then? I was in D company. And at this time, your rank was private or? I was a private. private. And it, when you found yourself in Belgium, they, you were the 75th, 289th was directed somewhere, or? I met this division in Belgium, in the woods, and I can remember our first meal together. They had a, the cooks had a big garbage can full of boiling water, and they threw in some cans of food, and we had our dinner by picking out the one that you wanted. So the one you kept really was the first one, because you didn't want to go back in again <laughs> in the hot water. <laughs> this doesn't sound as good as Florida. Or <laughs> so you opened it up, took out a spoon, and ate it right out of the can. Um. So at that time, did you sleep in tents outdoors or? Oh, something? oh no, we, we 
we would sleep outside. And, and this was about the middle of January, and, and about a week later, they decided to send us back to Colmar, France, which was near the German, Swiss, French border. So we got on a freight train, and we went, took us two days to go down to that area. There we got organized, and my first real battle was that right down there. Going into combat, I can remember going down this dirt road or muddy road, shall we say, and mortar shells were going around us. And kept following us all the way up the line, but fortunately, they did not have us lined up. They were off about 150 feet, maybe 200 feet, following us up, up the road. But these shells kept going off, and pieces of shrapnel were flying around us. Their training wasn't as good as yours, or was it? Well, I was happy that they yeah, sure. they missed us. We got up to this, uh, it's not a town, a little group of houses. We went up to these houses and they, they told me to uh, crouch down here and they were going to set up the machine gun in the back. First and, gunner went, uh, first and second gunner went around the back on the second floor on the porch. And they set the machine gun up. Just then, the German army sent in one of their artillery shells, an 88, was the 88 millimeter shell came in there and hit the back of that house. And I remember this glass exploding and shimmering all over the place. I thought it was the end of the world. Wow. Soon one of the uh, other men in our squad came running back to us and said that the first, I don't remember their names, the first gunner and the second gunner were wounded. So my first real job then was to help them into another building. We took them down into the basement. and. Medic came over and treated them. One was hit in the foot with a piece of shrapnel, and they had to cut his uh, boot off so that they could look at it. And the other man was hit in the side with a piece of shrapnel. And he was in pain. Medic came over and gave him some morphine. So that was your first uh that taste was, of combat? That was my first real taste of combat. I didn't get to shoot any guns, but I had plenty of chances to duck. Yeah. And that was down in that region where Swiss, Switzerland, France, and Germany kind of all yes. come together. Yes, near, near, near Colmar. Near yes. Colmar. Mm -hmm. The next morning, they told me, it was about 7 o'clock in the morning, they said, okay, ship, it's your turn to stand guard. They moved the gun over into a chicken coop. So I, they brought me in there and they said, here's a machine gun, and out there is the enemy. If you look out there through a little window and you can see nothing for quite a ways. The machine gun was right in front of the uh, chicken door would go up and down, so you could raise it up and down. It was closed, and they said, when you're ready to fire the gun, just open the door and start firing. So fortunately, nothing happened. I was on there for about four hours or so. The only other person in the room there was a, an observer from the, our mortar squad, and 
he saw any activities, why he was to call the mortars through a wireless wire telephone, give them directions. So the Colmar encounter, after that, you, your, 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 your unit was sent back north? Or? Well, yes, but we still stayed down there until the battle was over. We went into many towns. I remember one time we were going, the United States Army attack, makes an attack in a spread out formation. They don't line up single file and go in. Spread out formation. And we were going into this town, I don't recall the name of the town. Off to our left were the uh, riflemen, and it was this big explosion. Everybody stopped. You could see that one of the riflemen had stepped on a landmine. Well, the medic went up and was treating him. But we continued on going toward the town. Unfortunately, another rifleman ahead of them stepped on a mine, and he went down. The medic who was administering to the first one who was injured saw that he couldn't do anything else, so he went up to assist the second one who was up further. And while he was going up there, he stepped on a mine. And we could see one, two, three soldiers laying there, not moving. We continued on to this town. Everybody went into a single file and went step by step, following in a previous person's footstep. And you could tell it how it was because it was sort of muddy. And you'd step in these muddy spots and don't dare step off of this. Just follow it. And fortunately, we went through up to the town, and from there we spread out and went on. We learned several months later that the minesweepers came through there and they found something like 790 mines buried in that field out there. I saw three of them go off, and fortunately, everybody else was able to get through. And those poor men were, they were, they died. I would assume so. Step in I mean, we we don't know, yeah. we, we just kept on going and that was it. I would think that that act of that medic who went to rescue, went to administer to Juan, found that he couldn't do anything, went to the aid the other rifleman who was with the mine probably was the most courageous thing I've ever seen. Because yeah. he too ended his life. Yeah. So and we went through these different towns up there and we come across barriers in towns and roadblocks you couldn't get through there. So We'd walk through the house and find a hole in the wall and go through the hole in the wall and go around the barrier and just can't keep on going. And were you meeting with a lot of resistance or was it like rear guard action and these They were mines? They were trying to keep ahead of us. They, they would be sending an artillery and, and some rifle fire, mostly artillery. But, um, but we had the upper hand. You felt that the, the Germans were being thrown back. They were yielding they, ground. They were on French territory, and they wanted to get back to their own territory in Germany. And, and we just got to the edge of Germany, and, and they took tennis uh, back up to another spot. So after the, the Colmar, battle and then the, in that region, the, the, moving forward, was your unit then 
directed somewhere else? Or? Yes, we were. By the way, I want to mention that while we were down there in Colmar, we were not with the United States Army, we were attached to the French Army. Ah. And the French had the tanks there, and we were the riflemen. They decided to send us up to Holland to join the British Army. So we went up to Holland and joined the British Army. Were you impressed by the French Army and the British Army? Or? Well, we didn't have too much to do with the uh, French Army. I knew that they were uh, a little reckless. They would get out and out of their tanks behind a building and they'd build a bonfire to cook their dinners. And that only attracted fire. More shells would be coming in, you know. And, and we didn't like that. They would hop in their tanks and they felt safe. But here we are. The riflemen. Yeah. We were in a, if you're lucky if you're in a building. When we went up to Holland, why we met these English soldiers and they were a rifle, uh, machine gun squad. And they had been there since October, October to middle of February. And they had nice little wooden huts built, small, but they were serviceable, kept the rain off of us. They dug uh, trenches between where the guns were to be set up, and we were overlooking uh, our river. And our, our, our task was to keep the German army on the other side of the river. Now, they had been there for months and months, and one thing I learned by talking with them is that if the Americans would talk fast and you throw in a little slang, they could not understand what we were saying, even <laughs> though they talked English. So while we were there on this, on this border, why the Americans weren't sitting on their hands, every night they would send patrols across the river. The river. And we would, we would know about it, and they would ask us to shoot machine gun fire across to keep the enemy from looking around so they could get a chance to get down there and uh, look around. Their hopes was to pick up a prisoner. And they could interrogate the prisoner and yes. find out what's going on. Yes. Uh, I don't know if they ever got a prisoner, but they, uh, that was their job. And then about a week after we uh, had got, first got to this position, we crossed the river. And this was, would this have been in? Holland. This is still, this is in Holland. Yes. And then um, things get more interesting or more uh, dramatic? Well, the we, big battle. Or? Every day was a battle, many, many, many battles during the day, and sometimes at night. How we, did you react to that uh, stress or that sort of constant having to be constantly alert and on guard? Is that makes it difficult it, to sleep for a long it, time? And, it kept you awake. Yeah. We had no trouble sleeping because. We would switch on guards. Someone, we uh, had so few men that instead of being on two and off four, we, we would split the night up and spend four nights, uh, four hours, at a crack, and until two o'clock in the morning or so, when whenever it was, and then the, the other group would come on and take uh, take the guard until daybreak. And you would go back, and that would be your time to sleep, and you had confidence in, in your buddies keeping the enemy away from us. So was this anywhere near the Ardennes, or? No, it was, it was further north from the Ardennes. And, and we, the Ardennes was by Belgium. 
and Holland was a little bit uh, to the north of, of them. Then we went on until we finally got to the Rhine River, and which was in German territory. I can remember that when we first went into Germany, we walked in. And along the border, they had these huge dugout to keep tanks from going across there. Tanks would get caught if they went in there. And you're talking uh, maybe eight feet deep and 10 feet across. So a tank came in there, would go down in there and wouldn't be able to get up again. And then in the fields to keep uh, any gliders from landing in there, across the farmer's fields were these poles put up there, like almost like teepee poles, three, three of them in a, in a cluster. And so if the gliders came in there, they wouldn't have a smooth landing, and they would, with the soldiers um, on them, and they, they wouldn't have a smooth landing, and it would keep the enemy out. And we were the enemy to the uh, German people and the German soldiers. So we eventually worked up to the Rhine River. And we were there for about a week or so, maybe, uh, maybe a little bit longer than that. They told us, well, we've got some things, little projects for you to do. So we went back and they brought us to a pond of water and here was an American sailor there and he was going to teach us how to paddle a canoe. <laughs> paddle a canoe so we could cross the Rhine River. And the Rhine River, you know, you're talking a big one. It's not like the Des Plaines River. It was more like the Mississippi River. It was a big thing to go across. And so the sailor was there when we would have to hop into this little canoe and learn to paddle the, learn to paddle the canoe. Then we went back uh, up to the Rhine River and they told us that we were not going to be in the first wave, which was good news. <laughs> But they wanted us to set up a machine gun to fire across the Rhine River. And what they were going to do is they were going to put a net across the river to catch anything like floating mines or something floating down the river. The net would catch the, these the mines and and down, further down the river, a mile or so, they were going to make the actual crossing. And they went across like some, on platoons, I'm sure, the first ones across, and then in a day or two, they built a pontoon bridge across. But then doing this, protecting this net that they we're going to put across, we had to set up the machine gun. So there was a house that was under direct observation. So we went there every night with sandbags. Loaded, we loaded them in our Jeep. We had the Jeep driver, our squad leader, and myself. And we went to this house. And we picked out the second floor window. And this is where we're going to put these sandbags. And we drug, drug these sandbags up there. And went back and got more sandbags, and drove them up, and dragged them upstairs, and piled them all up there so we could have these sandbags around us. We were looking at this, and we thought, well, there's a lot of weight up there. So what we did was there was a dining room below with a dining room table. We took the dining room table and put it there, and took a bed, and put the bed lengthwise on a dining room table and wedged against the ceiling to hold up the, to hold up the sand of this 
weight up there. And because we couldn't actually tell where the target was going to be because it was nighttime. But they told us that was under direct fire. Fortunately, we had a, a good Jeep driver who was, I think he was from North Carolina, and he was used to getting around in some of the woods up there, and he could turn off all the lights. They had night lights for driving around at night, but he would turn off all the lights. So you'd step on a break, no taillight would go on, nothing. And he, and he would he would follow the path, and eventually we would get back to where the other people were, several miles away. Good driving. Good driving, yes. Mm -hmm. We were thankful for that. So then did you, your unit then cross the Rhine in the second wave, you were saying? Um, yes, we did, yes. Just about, uh, just about that time, our, our Jeep driver told us that he had some armor-piercing shells for our machine gun. The problem was that it also had tracer bullets in it. So he said, do you want this? And I told the squad leader, he said, yes, all we have to do is take out the tracer bullets and put in an another armor-piercing bullet in there. Armor piercing bullet were taped, were painted black. They had a harder shell and they had a, a little more pow powder. In them. They would go through a, a wall of a house, and the, most of the houses down there were stucco. They would go right through the outside wall and bury itself into the inside wall so that if anybody was in that room when we fired on it, they would be taken out. So we spent a lot of our free time, shall we say, taking out the tracer bullets, which is every third or fifth one. We took them out by hand and we shoved in a shoved in a replacement in there. And a tracer bullet is a it's not as heavy as the armor piercing. It was bullet. painted red, painted and it would red. burn as it was going through the air. So it would also show you where it was going, but it also show you where it was coming from. And we didn't want them to know where it was coming yeah. from. Because I was the first gunner, and it was my job to, well, I didn't have to, but I wanted to. I inspected every belt, box of ammunition, to make sure that everything was done the way it was supposed to be done. And did that armor-piercing uh, ordinance come in handy then, or did you have to well, it use did a lot of it? It did because we actually didn't knock any tanks out with it, but it would go, it had more power and it would go through buildings, the walls of a building. Wow. It did play a little havoc with our machine gun is it wore out the wore out the barrel. We had to before we crossed the Rhine River, why they sent us back to have our machine gun inspected and they, we took it all apart and laid it out. Ordnance man came around, he looked at that barrel and he says, What have you been doing with this barrel? He said, We just been using it, that's all. I didn't tell him that we were using armor piercing which would wear out the, the barrel more. So he said, well, I'll get you a new barrel. So he got us a new barrel for this. And put it all together and went, on we went. A few days later, why our Jeep driver drove up and he says, look what I got for you, a light machine gun. That was a heavy machine gun, which took two men to carry. This light machine gun, only one man would carry. Would that have been like 50 pounds or? 40 Less, pounds, 40, 40 pounds, pounds for the lightweight. Lightweight was 40 pounds, and, and the heavy machine was about 80 pounds. And they broke it down into two parts. So everybody was, would run carrying 40 pounds. And when somebody's shooting at you, you ran fast. <sighs> so 
So when does the, in all this movement of forces and crossing the Rhine and... We crossed the Rhine River, was at the end of March. I don't remember the exact date, but it was at, toward the end of March. So was that after the Battle of the, the Bulge then? Oh yes, was the Battle of the Bulge was in December and early January. Uh, toward, the, toward the end of January, maybe the 20th of January or something like that. And you that. saw action in that also, right? A little bit? Oh, there? just, just a, a minor part. Minor uh, part. Minor part. Yeah. I, was, I was just there just long enough to say that I should be awarded the <laughs> Battle of the Bulge <laughs> star. So, great. I made up for more than by uh, working uh, extra and getting other awards. You sure did. Um, so, Germany then, have you made it, if I can recall now, were you as far as Dortmund by that time or in this period here? Or? Well, they told us when we were going to cross the Rhine River, it was about two or three days afterward, they said the other, they're not re meeting any resistance. You're going to go up there and relieve them. And you're going to go 72 hours without re a break. Wow. 72 hours, and then somebody's going to come and relieve you after 72 hours. That's three days with, without any sleep. So we got up there, and we, re we relieved them, and we kept going as hard as we could go. This would be in, 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 in trucks sure. or jeeps or... No, walking. Walking. Oh, walking. Oh, we didn't have any... Even though you were an equipment man, you had to... We carried all of our... Our, our jeep was back a couple of miles there, following, following along with the command post. But they never reached us. We were at the front line. We had the front row seats. Three days hard march. Well, march or... I mean, walking, yeah. Walking. Yeah. Day and night. We thought we were lucky if we got two hours sleep. We're very lucky. Was that the most tired you've ever felt in your life? No, there was lots to keep us awake. Oh. Yeah. But fortunately, I was a, a track and cross country runner in high school. So I entered the Army in pretty good shape. So this long walking was, I didn't, I didn't feel it too much. To, is this the idea of not having any sleep? Yeah. So if you had a chance to get 15 minutes of sleep during the daytime, you took it. And that was it. And so you made your, your destination in the three days? or well, Three days. And then there was no relief for us. They said, keep going. Because we were going so fast, trying to catch the German army. And they, they were backpedaling. And uh, there wasn't any soldiers to relieve us. So we kept on going. And we kept on going and going. I can recall one time while we were in Germany, we came across uh, one morning about oh, about 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning, we were going into this town. And it was a, they had a, a block square fenced off camp. We got up to it, and our squad leader was the only one in anybody around there who had our wire cutters. So right, we don't go around, we go through. So he got the wire cutters out, cut a hole in, in the fence, and we went inside. And it was a prisoner of war camp. There were Polish and Russian prisoners inside there. And they did two things. One group went over to the group, came to greet us. And they were very happy to see us. And the people, our soldiers would be sharing cigarettes, whatever they had, they could give cigarettes. We couldn't share food, because we didn't have that. We, we didn't have extra food. But we did add cigarettes, and we could do without some cigarettes for a couple of days. Gave them cigarettes. The other half of these prisoners went to the kitchen, and they raided the kitchen. Their breakfast was 
cooked red cabbage. And they came out carrying handfuls of red cabbage, and they would be eating this cabbage. This These people were skinny, and they were happy to get any kind of food they could. They were skinny. You could see that they were malnourished, just weak, but they were happy to see us, and they were happy to eat their red cabbage. I know even to this day, when I go to a restaurant, I have a salad, and they put red cabbage on there. It takes you right back. I, w I will eat every smidgen of red cabbage. I, I remember it, and I... So thankful to uh, have, uh, have uh, been there and got there in good health. And then we got to the other side of the camp where the gate was. And they had one of these posts going up and down, like a railroad Crossing, gate. Yeah. And <clears throat> in order to get out, you had to raise this post up. And I, I told the guys, uh, and my buddies, said, we, we don't need this. Uh, come on and help me. So we put our weapons down, and we grabbed the whole end of this post, and we pushed on it, and we twisted it off. And these prisoners of war who were watching us, uh, they cheered, hooray, hooray. They, were, they could see their freedom, and they could see that we had released them from their camp. Fortunately, our squad leader could speak Polish, and he asked them where the German army was. And they said, they pointed to where they went, and they said they left about an hour ago. Whoa, you're getting close. And so we went on, and what we did is we came to a river. I believe it was a rural river, R-U-H-R, river. And that essentially ended our combat. We stayed there, and we, the Germans were now trapped. The big, their army was trapped, because we had came in around one side, and then another part of the American army was coming in on the other side, and they trapped them. And they were on the inside, and they couldn't go any place. They were, we were getting uh, German prisoners left and right. Were they in bad shape, the German army, at that point? Or? Well, bad shape. I, I know that they were, um, no, they, they were in pretty good shape. They were eating all right. And I don't know, I'm sure they weren't eating like we were. Mm -hmm. But the, the, their clothes were all right. And, but I think they were short of ammunition. Because there were a couple of times that they were firing, firing machine guns at us. And, we were out in the open. Boy, I'm telling you, that you can hear those bullets popping over your head, and you really are frightened. And, and they stopped. And I, you know, why didn't they keep firing? They could wipe us all out. One of our uh, ammo carriers, he's carrying two boxes of ammunition, one over the, on a belt over the front and one in the back. And one of these uh, bullets from the machine gun went right through the box of ammunition that he was carrying. So that without in, without injury to him, no no injury. Yes. Wow. But he he was he was pale. He 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 missed by inches being cut down. I know we went then we went up to this town and. Got up there. The rest of the battalion was behind the railroad track back there when they were they were supposed to be covering us, but I didn't hear any firing coming us. Looking around and 
were wondering where they were. I asked one of the riflemen, did anybody clear this first floor of this building, this house here? And he said, no. For some reason, I said, I'll do it. So I took out my pistol and I went up the stairway, step by step, and I'm walking up this stairway. And it, you know, what happens if he throws out a, a hand grenade? Or what if somebody's there? What am I going to do? But I had my pistol in my hand. It was a 45 caliber. And fortunately, there was nobody up there. But at least there was peace of mind that nobody was in that first house. And then we went down a little bit further, uh, about another block or so, looking for the enemy. I was looking at a, uh, out a window, and they dropped a, a mortar right in front of that window. And the mortar went off, and the uh, he, uh, shrapnel hit the window cell and hit me in the face. And fortunately, I wasn't wounded. I, I put my hands over my face. And I looked at my hands to see if there was blood I, that I, I thought for sure there was blood, but there wasn't. And my squad leader was watching, looking at me, and he's laughing and laughing. And I said, what's the matter? And am I bleeding? And he said, no, no, you look all right. But it was the chalk that was bouncing off your helmet. And my, my helmet was, had these streaks of chalk on there from, from this. So at this point, then, the, the war in Germany is winding down, in a sense? Yes. Uh, we got up to that river, and, and we sat on one side, and, and we could see them on the other side. I know while we were there, a couple of days later, why I got an American soldier coming up, and I went out to meet him and to ask him what they can do for him. And he said, he's got a tank. Uh, or a half track with a artillery. You're looking for targets. They were looking for targets, and I said, "Oh, I'll give you a target. Come on up here." So he, so he, I brought him up there to the where our machine gun was on the top of the river bank, looking over to the other side. And he, see those houses on there? You see that door, that that house with the red door. There was a lot of activity going on there. You could see soldiers going in and out of there. So he called his tank up there. He came up there, and one first shell hit the, hit the building. The second shell went right through that red door. And they put another shell in there, and then they hightailed it out of there. Of course, they're not sitting over there. The Germans weren't sitting over there just taking this. They had somebody watching us, and they could see this. So I learned later on from the other machine gun that was down the road about a block or two uh, that out came this flat car on the railroad track and had a, an artillery piece on it. And it they shot over a couple of rounds at us. In the meantime, the tank had left. But they're shooting at us, though. So here we are sitting there. Oh, man, oh, man. So fortunately, uh, nobody was hurt. So you never had to, you never had to cross that river then? No, we didn't have to cross or? that. But that more or less ended the battle, as we were concerned, because the entire German army was surrounded. Now, we didn't know this per se. We found this out later on. This was our, our objective. And they were on one side, and we were on the other. In the meantime, the Russian army was entering Berlin or something? Entering Berlin and, and coming in. Yes. So um, did you receive a promotion while you were in in Europe? Well, 
I'll tell you the promotion that I got. The first promotion I got was the first man in combat. Our cat captain said, <clears throat> after your first night in combat, you were promoted from private to PFC. And you're also awarded, so I got a stripe. You're also awarded the combat infantry badge. And that was nice because it gave us $10 a month more. <laughs> now, we didn't have any place to spend it, but it was really nice. It was like a, a big raise, like, uh, I don't know, 30 or 40 percent raise. How can, you, how can that be? Well, I was sending an allotment home out of my paycheck. I was getting $65 a month, and I was sending something like $50 a month home to my parents, and they could pay off the house that they were uh, living in. And so I was getting about $15 a month, but I didn't have any place to spend it. And they put more t 10 more dollars on it, so this, this was great. So that was, that was nice. Yeah. And as far as other promotions, well, I'll tell you what happened, uh, happened after that. We were, as the war ended there in early May, well, we were going around, riding around in our Jeep, because we had uh, this facility. And we would ride around looking for German soldiers. We could um, find a civilian there. And what is this young civilian doing in German in civilian clothes? What young man doing in civilian clothes? So we'd start, and we'd ask him, so the soldat? That was one of the more German words that we know. And they said, yeah or yes, then we'd take them and send them into where they were gathering all the prisoners. So all these prisoners were eventually, with all the others that were captured, were sent back to France. And it was the near Reims, uh, R H E I M S. I'm not exactly the, don't remember the closest town. And they decided to send our division back to this camp. And what they were going to do uh, was process the Air Force to send them over to Japan because the war was still going on. And most of them, so I went there, and uh, they looked at my record and said, oh, this, this man can type. It's going way back to the what happened a year ago. This man can type. Let's put him in the office. So I got a job typing. And which was a little easier. You know, worked from nine to five. And it was really nice. That typing teacher in high school uh, must have been good. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> I, I, I enjoyed it. And yeah. I know I was in a class. I, I think I was the only boy in the class. It paid yeah. off. It paid off, yeah. And I still use typing to this day, working on the computer. So, so when did they make you a sergeant? Well, that's a long story. You know, I, I was, we were processing these soldiers, these Air Force men. Most of them were going back to the United States, but some of them were going directly over to the Middle East. They weren't, they weren't going home. So we were doing that, and I was always a PFC. Then, then the war in Japan ended, so everybody was sending, went back to the United States. About that time, they said, well, we're going to disband in the 75th Infantry Division, and 
I was uh, going to be transferred someplace. I was working in this office, which were assigning these different people. I was under a, a major, Major Vars, real nice man. Major Vars, V A R S, I believe. And he was from the Air Force. And uh, he liked me. He says, I'm going to send you back to Germany. Oh, no, I don't want to go back to Germany. I'm going to go to some place that's right next on the dock. Maybe they got an empty space, and I'll get right on. You know? He sent me back to Germany. So I went back to Germany in the, in the headquarters company. CBS, it was the Continental Base System, or something like that. And he sent me back to this town in Germany, Bad Nauheim, which was a headquarters company. There was a general there. And it turned out to be a real nice deal. <laughs> we, this town during the war, was a hospital town. And before the war, it was in the 30s, and is, people would go to this town, Bad Nauheim, and get hot baths, mineral baths. We had to put these people someplace. So the town was loaded with hotels. Lo and behold, two of us were assigned to a room in a hotel. And that's where we stayed. Hey, this was great. Couldn't, couldn't believe it. All we had, uh, all you had to do was be to work on time, go home in the evening. I, I was attached to the special services, which was in charge of entertainment for the troops. Now, I wasn't a singer or a dancer. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I knew how to do was be a typewriter. But I, was, but I got there, and there was about 35,000 troops that had to be entertained. So how did they do that? Well, they would have, we would have a, a, ca a little catalog, and they could order out of this catalog what they needed. Sports equipment, soccer balls, volleyballs, nets, and, and balls. And baseballs and bats and things like that, and whatever they needed. And we would look the, their requisitions over, their little equipment, and some little company, uh, who knows where they were, would order one ball and, and one bat. And then, hey, what happens if that ball wears it's out? Lost, yeah. <laughs> or what if the bat breaks? You know? yeah. So we would feel sorry for these people, and we would change the order from one to two. Make sure that they got enough. There was plenty of equipment there, so that was, that was it. So this being a, a headquarters company, why we uh, had our breaks in the morning. Never had a break before. Go down and have coffee. And uh, the general was in the same building. And he thought we had a, ought to have cookies. <laughs> so we had cookies with our coffee. Hey, you couldn't. Now, we didn't serve ourselves. We just went down and sat down. And they had maids come in and serve us. They hired the civilians to come in and serve us. This was great. Tablecloths, everything. Boy, this was great. And we had our meals down there, too. So this, this was nice. So Major Vars did you a favor by? He did me a favor. He, he sent me to this place, and there was a colonel. I don't recall his last name. And he was in charge of this group. And the, they had these different people on the line. And as time went by, the sergeant would be sent home. the master sergeant. So they replaced him with the tech sergeant. And the tech sergeant had to be replaced with a staff sergeant. 
And the staff sergeant had to be placed with a sergeant. Well, we didn't have a sergeant. Well, here I am. I'm a private first class. They promoted me. Uh, they skipped a grade and they promoted me to sergeant. Hey, this was nice. Before you know it, the same thing happened again. The master sergeant is sent home. Let's replace him with the tech sergeant. Let's replace him with the staff sergeant. They moved me up to staff sergeant. And same thing happened again. Sent the staff master sergeant home and kept moving in. And oh, the next man in line, there I was. I, before you know it, I was promoted to tech sergeant. Had, a, had an officer, had a civilian typist working for us. We had some German people working for us. We had a gymnasium. We had one of our men running the gymnasium. Uh, we're sending all these supplies out to people. The Red Cross workers were knew me by first name because we would get the music of the popular song being played in the States. And we would give them the music and they would give it to the local bands, the German bands, and they would learn the new songs. And that made the troops happy. So it, at the age then of um, were you 20 or 21, you're 20. You're practically you're 20. an executive. Or I, 20, I was a, te a technical sergeant. Wow. But then all good things had to come to an end, I suppose. All good things had to come to an end. Yeah. So two things came, and came to an end. Uh, uh, the colonel said, you know, we don't have a master sergeant. I want Bill to become a master sergeant. Write up the order. Send in the order. And I, sh I should mention, too, that this colonel was a principal of a high school in Indiana. I don't remember his name. I don't remember what town he was from. But I was the youngest of anybody around there. And I think he related to me. And he, he liked me. So he, he moved me along. So he wanted me to move, move to master sergeant. He sends the order in, and they sent it back. It was declined because I was going home. He said, send me a copy of the order. And they, uh, they said, well, it's not made yet. But we can't promote him because he's going to go home. So I wasn't promoted to master sergeant, which is just fine. That's OK. You would much rather have gone home? Oh, definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. In the meantime, this was in June of 1946. It was about time for the colonel to go home, and, and they were going to reassign him to the inspector general's office. And he said, Bill, I want to take you to be my assistant. So he put me in for to be his assistant, but they didn't approve that. I was going to be his jeep driver and go around inspecting these different facilities. But that didn't come to pass. It so happened that a couple of weeks later, I got my orders to go for discharge, report to the dock where it, where it, where it was. And uh, I met the colonel there. We were going home on the same ship. You sailed from France or England? or No, it was from Germany. From Germany. Bremen? Bremen. Bremen. I believe it was Bremen, yes. Mm -hmm. And the, I met the colonel there, and we could just say hello. That was about it. And, uh, so before we, we leave the, the European theater, um, you received, uh, in addition to these promotions, you also received medals that uh, testimony to your progress and uh, performance. Uh, yes. And some of those medals were the Bronze Star and... I got the Bronze Star for the um, 
my service in doing good service in in the Rhineland. That was and I also got the Good Conduct Medal. You, in order to get the Good Conduct Medal, you had to be in the Army three years. I wasn't in the Army three years, but at the end, when the war ended, they wanted to give everybody something. So anybody who was not being court-martialed got the Good Conduct Medal. So I was in about not even two years, he said, you get the Good Conduct Medal. Great. I also got the European Theater of Operations uh, Medal at the ETO with three battle stars. One was for the Battle of Bulge, the other one was for Central Europe, and the third one was for the uh, Battle in the Rhineland. Then they also gave everybody a victory medal. Everybody who was in the in service got a victory medal because we won the war. And this was after, after the Japan. Which August, in, yeah. In yeah. August. Yeah. After that, then, then in addition to the bronze, uh, to the, the condition to the good conduct medal in, in May, by, when the war ended, over in Pacific, then they, uh, that was the end of the war, so they gave everybody a victory medal. So I got the victory medal. And also for my uh, time in Germany, they had to be there one year, and with the time in France and Germany, a part of uh, the Army of Occupation was one year. It was a little over a year. So I, I got the Army of Occupation medal, too. So you arrived back in the United States then in um, June or July of uh, it was June forty six or so. About June fifteenth. It didn't take me very long after I got off the ship to put me on a train, send me to Fort Sheridan, fill out papers, and did the ship come into New York or uh, into New York? New York. Ship came into New York. And train to a train to Fort Sheridan. Then you get your papers. We got our discharge papers. Yes, it was a quick thing, tur yeah. quick turnaround. So how it must have been a little bit of a transition for you know you were you had an office and uh, somebody reporting to you and you were uh, helping colonels and whatnot and now you're you're back in civilian life. How did that how did that all seem to you or what did you do next? Well, one of the things that I was happy about was to be home. And I think that was uh, everybody's thought in their mind. I, w I want to get home. And so when everybody got home, why, uh, that, was, that was great. I know everybody didn't make it, but I know there was one uh, soldier named Walter Lane Weber, L E I N W E B E R, Wally Lane Weber. I went to high school with him. We went in the service together, we went down to Camp Landing. We went across on the same ship, and we got into uh, into Europe there, and we were separated and assigned to different units. We weren't there a month, and I heard that uh, Walter had been killed in action. That was something. Now, if you look on the Illinois report for those who are deceased servicemen in Illinois, you won't find Walter Langweber. You will find Lawrence Langweber. Lawrence. But he didn't like that. 
name. He wanted to go by his middle name. And his middle name is Walter. And we always call him Wally. So, for example, that fall, of, in the fall of 1946, you know, you've been out a month or two. Did you, did you decide you wanted to go to work or go to school or? When I was in high school, I decided I wanted to go to school. In fact, the coach told me I could get a scholarship at Marquette University for track. And I was up in Wisconsin. And I said, well, I can't because I'm going into service. So when I came home, why the GI Bill of Rights was supplying an education for it, for all the servicemen. It went based on the time you were in service, how much time you spent overseas. I think that was about it, depending on how many months you could get of education. So when I was in high school, I was taking college preparatory. I was taking Latin and math and sciences. And that was a college preparatory course, but there was no college for me. But I was ready to go in. At that time, the University of Illinois was going to open a campus at Navy Pier. And I was, had my name on the list on the first page. I wanted to go there. So they set up a program. They, they did not open in September. I believe they opened in October because they could not get it ready. They just went in through Navy Pier and they made little walls, partition walls, all the way down the line. And each room was a classroom. I went there and, and uh, went there for a year and a half. I went to summer school. I took some placement tests and I got some college credit. Um, yeah, I, I went and after a year and a half, I had 60 hours of credit. I applied to John Marshall Law School and I was accepted. And I went to law school, and I graduated from John Marshall Law School in June of 1951. So you, you didn't run track at Marquette, but you no, got your law degree Marquette. at John Marshall. Yeah. I did have a track at, at Illinois, Navy Pier. They had a big gymnasium out there, and we would run around on the outside. And I remember I was on the cross-country team. They didn't have it the first year, they had it the second year when I was there. And so I was among the first, in the first group that they gave letters to. So you lettered then in? in I lettered at the University of Illinois, Navy Pier, Navy Pier, which is now University of Chicago. Uh, the Illinois of Chicago. Yeah. University of Illinois, Chicago. Yeah. Yes. The, um, were you able to stay in, in contact with any of the, your wartime buddies or? For a while, there, there was some group in Chicago. I mean, we had a little 75th Infantry Division group meeting in Chicago, but the, their tastes didn't meet with mine, didn't mesh with mine. I had, I had other di ideas, and so um, I stopped with them. But they did have a national one, and I did uh, go down to uh, St. Louis one time, went to Cleveland another time. So and did you join any of the, any of the um, national service organizations, or? Uh, no, just the 75th Just the 75th. Yes. So the, those were the reunions that you attended then, those? those yes. Yeah. Yeah, a group would get together, and I don't know how many would show up, 50 or 100. Um, there's a question that's recommended here as we approach the close. Um, um, how do you think 
your military service uh, and your experiences during the war, how do you think they affected your life? You get to appreciate people. You get to appreciate the uh, your ser fellow servicemen. Any day, anyone could be hit or even lose their life. And everybody worked together. We, di we didn't. We weren't separate individuals. We worked together. And I may have lost contact with them. But I still remember them. They were good, good guys. There was one thing that, that I want to mention here. While uh, I was in service, the war was going on, they had a a group of women writing letters to soldiers. And I had three or four girls, some I knew from high school and some I didn't. They were writing encouraging letters. And when we got our mail, which was about every three weeks or so, to get a letter from somebody telling how things are going at home, and everything was uplifting. Why, that was uh, something, uh, something to remember. Do you think your military experience um, has influenced your thinking about war or about the military in general? I wouldn't have traded my experience in the um, Army for anything. I don't recommend anybody going into service because you can lose your life and that would be the end of things. But going in for your country, and that's what I did, went in for my country. I went in with millions of others. And we, do, we did what we had to do. Some was nice and someone was not so nice. And you have a tendency to remember only the nice things that happen. As far as changing my life, I can uh, remember uh, when I went into service, my mother gave me a medal. Uh, which was carried by my, uh, which was carried in uh, World War I by my Uncle Will. He survived the, the war. I don't know what type of action he was in, but he was caught up in the influenza outbreak and died from influenza. He carried a medal with him when he was in war. And my mother inherited from him. She, they shared. She had to share with her other brothers and sisters. And there was seven all together. And she took this. So when I went into service, 
but she gave me this medal, which I carried with me every day. And to have the strength that was given to me is something I can never forget. I now have this medal posted with my on a plaque with my other medals. And I can see it every day. And before this interview, we, we took a picture of you um, holding that uh, plaque of composite medals and this, this special religious medal that you mentioned. And, uh, That'll be added to this, uh, the record for people to see for, um, for the Veterans History Project. Well, that seems like a most appropriate note on which to uh, conclude the interview. Um, and unless you feel like there's anything else to say, maybe we'll um, conclude the interview at this time, if that's okay, Bill. Unless yeah. you want to add something there. Right now, I, I can't think of anything else. I think I did mention a couple of things that I wanted to mention. Uh, Wally Lane Weber. And the people who wrote to me while I was in, in service. I never ended up marrying any of them. But that wasn't the purpose. The purpose was to give us uplifting spirits and for everybody to get a letter was really something. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Bill. Bill and I are returning to the um, the interview now on um, Tuesday afternoon, February the 28th, in the year um, 2006. And uh, we're back sitting in the large meeting room, Section B. And um, interestingly, um, uh, Bill's daughter uh, asked her dad if he had told us about a couple of stories that she remembered. And so uh, it's wonderful that uh, <laughs> she's uh, going to be responsible for us adding a, uh, some color and humor to the further color and humor to the transcript. And Bill, you have a, uh, some notes there about what you think uh, your family feels should be in the, in the interview as they remember Dad? Well, I was asked if I include the story, the pup tent story. When we were overseas, we first went into Belgium in the, in the woods, and there was no tents there. You just lived either in the open, or if you were lucky, you got into a house. And that's the way it was during the first part of 1945. We were living mainly in the houses, but once in a while, we had to stay outside. As we got further into Germany, why there always wasn't a place for us to stay, to sleep overnight. And one time when we were in reserve, our one of the officers who takes care of all of the equipment made a survey to find out uh, who had a pup tent, and actually none of us had a pup tent. <laughs> One reason we didn't is because it, it was a lot of weight to carry. It's a half of a tent. And 
two men would get together and put them to put them together and make you make a little t tent so you can sleep in. Well, so, none of us had a pup tent, so he made an effort to get everyone a pup tent or a half of a pup tent. So this was all well and good, but here we are, we're carrying machine guns, and we're carrying, uh, if you weren't carrying a machine gun, well, you were carrying a couple of boxes of ammunition, and this adds up to at least 40 pounds of weight, in addition to all the clothes you got, the rations you have to have, your water, your a personal weapon, a, a pistol, or a rifle, plus layers and layers of clothes. So one way to shed some weight is to get rid of the pup tent. So we didn't have a pup tent. So this officer said, everybody gets a pup tent. So we all got a pup tent at this, this particular time, and we were sleeping in a barn up in a hayloft for a day or two. And as we got these pup tents, we were getting ready to pull out. And individually, everybody decided we can't carry a pup tent in addition to whatever we got. So everybody individually took their pup tent and buried it under the straw in the hayloft. So we didn't have a pup tent. So we leave, and we go, and carry out uh, up to the front in, in battle there for our uh, turn or a week or so, whatever it was. Next time we came in the, off the line in reserve where they Officer was out there, and he said he found 20 or 30 pup tents buried in the hayloft, and he did not <laughs> like it. So all of these were, pup tents were retrieved, and everybody got a pup tent again. Well. We still had a lot of weight to carry around and a pup tent. We tried to get into a house someplace, a building, a barn, whatever it would be, someplace for, for overnight. Not during the day, but overnight for some kind of shelter. And so we took these pup tents and being in reserve, they gave us our duffel bags. Not wanting to carry these pup tents, we took, uh, took the pup tents and put them in the duffel bag. We didn't bury them in any place, in the straw or anything. We put them in the, in the duffel bag, and they put them on a supply truck, and away they went. So we went on, and everybody was happy. <laughs> we still had a pup tent. It wasn't in our... It was in our possession on a, in a duffel bag many miles away from us. But at least we didn't have to carry this added weight of whatever it was. But Somebody might have got yeah. some use from wherever they went to, I suppose. Well, we would get the duffel bags back again. The next oh! Time, next time, every time we came, our shaving gear was in there and things like that, so when, and soap and all of that. So when we went back, we would clean up and shave, and that was, and our chance to change clothes. And did that, uh, it never happened again that that officer uh, asked everybody, okay, produce your pup tents now. He never he didn't No, no, know. because he didn't find any. He, he <laughs> thought they were all with us. So that was a good, that was the idea of the day, whoever came up with that one, huh? 
where we thought that up. Or, yeah, well, yeah. I think we individually decided this is a good place to get rid of it. I know we didn't have any meeting. It just happened. Everybody just took it and buried it in the straw. Because you were saying the pup, if you were carrying the ammunition and the weaponry and then having to carry a, a pup tent on top of that, you would really have been laden down. Definitely. We yeah. were laden down as it was. Yeah. And we had to track through mud. And we had to carry a extra pair of socks. Yeah. We never carried things like shaving or anything like that. We yeah. just let that go until we got back off the line. And off the line is being right at the front. Okay. First row. So this was a story that was occurred while you were on the front line. And yes, then that was in 1945, spring of 1945, spring of 45. or March. I would say probably March, because the heavy snow was over. And your next story, this takes place somewhere else, right? When we were coming home after the war, this was in 1946, came back on a Liberty ship, which was they built thousands of them, and they would carry a thousand men back and forth across the ocean. And we came back on this uh, Liberty ship with a thousand men on it, and it was nice because we had a good place to go. We were coming back to the United States. Yay. Hooray! Hooray! Yeah. When we got to New York, we pulled in the harbor, and for the first time, I saw the Statue of Liberty. It was the first time that most of us saw the Statue of Liberty. And I'm telling you, it was really a joyful sight. Everybody was up on deck looking at it and, and really saying that they were happy to be back home, and they had a band playing at the dock, welcoming, uh, welcoming uh, us. And as the ship pulled up toward, toward the dock and it was t being tied up, why there were some men down there who had little cartons of milk and they were throwing them up onto the deck. And we, we would catch one and we would, oh boy, this was a joy. They have a milk, fresh milk. The first time we had it and since we were overseas, we had powdered milk, but not fresh milk. So that was, that was a, a, a the main thing as I remember about it was the Statue of Liberty and everybody being happy about yeah. seeing this. And it looked so great. We read about it when we were in, in school. And now to actually see it. And then you're, you're almost there toasting it with, uh, and with toasting, fresh milk. Toasting, toasting it with fresh milk. Yes. Yeah. And, and we could not have been happier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's a great final memory of, uh, of years of service. Kind of summarizes it. Summarizes a it very, all. Up. Yeah. A very happy note. Yes. Yeah. I think your daughter was right, Bill. <laughs> Thank you.